Um, my name is Sandeep. I was born and raised in the U.S. Um, and as I was saying a few minutes ago, I actually grew up 100% convinced that I was going to do everything but go into to education. I would have told you there was no way I was going to become a teacher growing up. Um, and I, as I got a little bit older, I was a couple of months away from actually taking a big decision, which was to go to medical school. I'd already been accepted to medical school. And I had this bit of an epiphany, a breakdown, whatever you want to call it. But it was this realization that I was doing medicine for all of the wrong reasons. Um, I realized that I was doing medicine because I wanted to make a lot of money. I realized that I was going to do medicine because my parents had told me it was the right thing to do. But I did not want to do it for the reason of wanting to make the world a better place. And I had a bit of a conversation with myself and I said, who's the type of person I want to be when I look in the mirror 50 years from now? And I realized that on the path that I was on, that was not the type of person I was going to become. And so a bit on a whim, I actually joined this program called Teach for America, where I taught for two years in a low income school in Washington, DC. So I taught seventh and eighth grade science in Washington, DC. Um, had an incredible experience, had an experience that was incredibly challenging. I taught kids that came from environments and backgrounds that were tough. Kids that were exposed to everything from gang violence to all sorts of stuff. Um, and those experiences, they shook me. Um, and they also showed me that this was the work that I really wanted to be doing. And so a few months after I got done teaching, I actually jumped on a plane and flew to India where I came to help get Teach for India off the ground. Um, and that's where I've been for the past 11 years. I've been working with Teach for India, serving in a number of different roles, but working to basically build this organization and to try to, to build our fellowship program. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm going to introduce you to a few people that I met along the way as I was writing this book. And, and one of them is a child named Malini. Um, and so Malini actually lives in, in Govandi. And Govandi is one of the largest slum communities in Bombay. Um, and Govandi, for, for those of you that don't know a lot about it, right? It's a, not only is it one of the largest slum communities, but it has statistics that in many ways are, are mind numbing. It has levels of poverty that you really wouldn't find in most places in the city. It has a life expectancy of 39 years of age compared to 67 years of age for the rest of, for the rest of India. Um, it has an apothecary, so it has a chemist um, for every 10,000 people, whereas the rest of India you have a chemist for every 1,000 people. It has levels of disease and poverty that parallel what you would find only in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this community, well, it sits next to this giant landfill called the Dionar landfill, right? And this landfill is basically where all of the city's trash just gets dumped. And so you've got this giant slum community that sits next to this enormous landfill that just collects the city of Mumbai's trash. And as I was writing this, I spent several days just chatting with people, kids, parents of this community. And as I was trying to find people to talk to, several teachers pointed me to this girl named Malini. And everybody kept saying, you have to talk to Malini. You have to talk to Malini. And she's one of our favorite kids. And I, and I sat down with this child and I started to talk to her. And as I'm talking to her, you realize why people want you to speak to her. She just has this smile that lights up the room. She, within the first couple of minutes, starts talking to you about Finding Nemo. She starts talking about how the boy in the striped pajamas is one of her favorite books. She starts telling you about the cartoons she loves to watch. And she's 15 years old. And she's got this way of making you feel just really warm and really at ease. And so I'm sitting here, I'm talking to Malini, and a few minutes into the conversation, she says, hey, do you want to come and meet my mom? And so I start walking with Malini towards her house, and you know, we, we, we leave the school, and we're walking through Govandi. And the way that Govandi is structured is 
the closer you actually get to this landfill, the cheaper your rent is. And the farther away you live from the landfill, well, the more expensive your rent is. And so you've got residents living about a half a kilometer away from the landfill and they're paying several thousand rupees per month. And you've got residents that live right next to the landfill and they're paying two or 300 rupees a month. And so we're walking through these winding lanes of, of Govandi and we get to Malini's house. And Malini's house is about 200 meters away from the DNR landfill. And so she's got this tin shed constructed house and inside the tin sheds, you've got pieces of plastic and trash that are actually just figuring out how to keep the monsoon rain out. And so we walk into her house and her mother's sitting there. And so her mother cuts cardboard boxes for a living and her dad is a rag picker in the landfill. And her mother starts to talk to me and her mother, you know, starts talking to me about Malini and she looks at me and she says, you know, these teachers of Malini, well, they keep coming to me and they keep talking to me about college. And all of them keep saying, you know, we want Malini to go to college. We want Malini to go to college. And, and Malini has been with Teach for India now for the past seven or eight years. And, you know, she's gotten an education to where she's going to go to college next year. And she looks at me and she says, you know, I want to believe them. But at the same time, I don't know if I can believe them. And I look back at her and I say, well, why can't you believe them? What would be, what would be wrong with that? What would be wrong with her going to college? And she snaps back at me and she says, listen, you know, these people, they keep coming and they keep talking about college. But she says, look at my condition and look at where I am right now. And she says, I know that you're sitting in my house and you're probably judging my house. But if you were to know what we have been through before we moved into this house, you would realize that we are lucky to even be here. You would realize that we are lucky to even be alive. And she looks at me and she says, you know, if you would have seen what we've been through over the past two decades, you would realize that it is a privilege for my husband to even be picking rags in that landfill. And she looks at me again and she pauses this time. And she says, listen, I wake up every single morning and I do one thing. I pray for a blessing. I pray for a blessing because I realize that is the only thing that is going to get me through this day. So these teachers, these fellows, they can be talking to me about college, but that's not what's going to get me through this day. I walked out of Malini's house that evening, folks, thinking about all that her mom shared and all that she shared. And I walked out very honestly, heavy. And I walked out heavy because I was thinking about the fact that the only thing that could possibly account for Malini's states is just the deep oppression that she goes through. The oppression and the inequity that she has experienced for years on end. And so that's Mali. And Asif is a child that basically was, was showing me around this community. And he is this 16 year old child who is now in college. And he has probably the best manners I've ever seen in a child. He's the kind of child that's walking around with you and, and he's the kind of child that refuses to go first wherever you're walking. He insists that you go in front of him. He's the kind of child that will open every single door before you go in. He's the kind of child that will never interrupt you and will always make sure that you feel comfortable. And so Asif and I are, are walking around and we just leave Malini's house because he's been with me this whole time. And he can see that I'm starting to look a little bit heavy. And he looks over at me and he says, you know, Sandeep, why are you feeling so heavy? Like, what's wrong? Like, why are you not, what's wrong? And I, and I look at him and I said, I don't know. But I said, I have a question for you. And I said, if you could basically take a magical ticket. And that magical ticket would get you into any single school in this city. Where would you go? And he looks back at me and he thinks for a second. And he says, you know, if I had a magical ticket, 
I think I'd probably go to Bandra. And I was like, why Bandra? He says, well, if I had a magical ticket, that's easy. Well, I'd go to the Ambani school because the Ambani school is where it's all at. The Ambani school is where all of the rich kids are, and that's where I'd love to be. And I looked at him and I said, you know, don't you think it's a little bit unfair that what's differentiating you from the kids in Bandra is that it's money. And he looks back at me with this look like I'm just crazy. And he says, don't you understand, Sunday? Everything in India runs on money. Why would education be any different? A few minutes ago, I asked you what, what gray sunshine means to you. Um, and I'm going to tell you what it means to me. Um, I think gray sunshine to me is rooted in the realization that for the vast majority of India's kids, our country's children are, are living in the grayness. They are the Malinis and the Asifs, and they are living so deeply in the grayness. And the truth is, is that amidst that grayness, there are rays of sunshine. There are people who are doing some incredible work. There are kids like Malini and Asif who have so many assets, so many things that they bring to the table. But the truth is, is that those rays of sunshine never really shine fully. They're always checkered with grayness. And I think that's what Malini showed me. And that's what Malini's mom showed me, is that the sun never really shines fully. And as of today, it's not shining fully. Folks, these stories are symptomatic of something much larger. We live in a country right now, ladies and gentlemen, where we have 76% of kids dropping out. We have less than 10% of kids actually making it to college. We live in a country where we have more than 50% of kids in grade five that can't read a grade two text, more than 50% of kids in grade five that can't recognize simple division problems. We have statistics that define our education system right now that are simply mind-numbing. And a lot of people ask me, well, why did I write this book? Like, what was it that drove me to write this book? And the truth is, is that I've been working with kids in India for the past 11, 11 and a half years. And what I have come to realize more than anything else is that underlying these statistics are human faces. Underlying these statistics are stories of kids whose futures are at stake. Underlying these statistics are human lives that could not be more real. I wrote this book, folks, to really try to make sure that we get those stories out there, to try to get people to see and to connect with the human faces that are not that different from anyone else that are underlying all of these statistics. And I want you to meet somebody named Anurag. Okay? Anurag was actually a, a Teach for India fellow. So he taught for two years in a low-income private school in Delhi. And about a year into his teaching experience, Anurag came to school and he planned a whole lesson where he really wanted to introduce his kids to the USA report. And he wanted to basically teach his kids about the inequity in education that exists across India. And so he brings this USA report into his school and he starts showing his kids the statistics. And the kids start asking, they say, Anurag, this isn't, you know, where is this data coming from? And he said, well, it's coming mostly from rural India. And so his kids said, well, don't you have data from our community? And Anurag kind of looked at me and he said, actually, the truth is that I don't. And so his kids shot back and they said, but you're showing us data from India and you're expecting us to basically try to talk about our community, but you don't actually know what the data is in our community. And then Anurag paused and he said, 
you know, you're right. Actually, I don't know what, what the condition is in our community here in Delhi. And, and so he actually turned that around into a challenge for his kids. And he said, well, what if we were actually to go out and collect that data right here in our community? And so his kids basically spent the next several weeks learning what they needed to do to figure out how to actually become proper researchers. And so they learned all about survey methodology. They learned all about what it means to collect data. They studied the methodology that Pratham and the USA report uses. They studied the methodology that other organizations use. And these were six standard kits. And after a few weeks of studying and basically immersing themselves in the methodology, they eventually went out and they started surveying all the kids that they could find from the community. And they started using the same USER assessment where they were testing mathematics and literacy. And they started collecting all of that data. And after a few weeks, they had gathered data from several hundred kids in the community. And they came back and they compiled all that data. And what they found was that the data was actually no better than what the USER report found. And so as you can imagine, as kids got really angry and they said, we need to figure out how to do something about this. And so as kids over the next several weeks ended up figuring out how to start forming everything from tutoring camps to one-on-one -on -one mentorship with other kids to after school classes where you actually had kids teaching kids from the community how to read, how to form mathematics, how to get better at academics. And I mentioned this story as a closing story because when I think about the type of education we need to be giving our kids, I think this is it for me. I think it's the kind of education that empowers our kids to better understand their communities, but the type of education that empowers our kids how to figure out how to do something about what they see, how to solve the problems that they come across. Folks, we at Teach for India run an organization where we believe two big things. One, we believe that every single child deserves an excellent education, and that is what we are trying to figure out how to do. We also believe that in order to do that, we want to figure out how to build a movement of leaders, leaders like Anurag, who are working relentlessly to eliminate educational inequity across the country. Right now, we have about 1,000 of these fellows serving about 32,000 kids. Um, and they're working to do just that. They're working to figure out how do you give kids an education that will fundamentally transform the lives of our kids. I mean, my overall take, folks, is that I don't think that examinations in and of themselves are bad things. I think it depends on what we do with those examinations. And I think that's what it's going to determine a lot. If those examinations are used for wider detentions, I think it can have a very negative impact and perpetuate inequity. But I think if we're able to use examinations to learn and to understand basically how we can better serve kids, I think examinations can be hugely helpful. I think the problem that we have in India is that oftentimes we end up using assessments purely as evaluative and judgmental tools. And that's what I think 100% fuels inequity. But I, I think... The big question that I'm grappling with is how do we move, how do we not get rid of examinations and look at assessments as the bad things, but say, actually, we need to change how we use our assessments to help us get better. And that's, I think, the fundamental shift. And so I just want to clarify that. I think the assessments in and of themselves aren't bad. It's, it's how we're using them. And that's what's basically perpetuating inequity. I think, interestingly enough, we've actually been quite, quite fortunate. Um, I think what we have found overwhelmingly in the thousands of classrooms that we've served in over the past 11 years is that the vast majority of kids that we've worked with are coming to school really wanting to learn. Um, the vast majority of kids that we have worked with are coming to school really hungry to learn. Um, and I think because we start with kids as they get into primary grades, I think we found that most often. As our kids have gotten older, of course, we face all of the challenges that come with adolescence. Um, 
And I think that's probably where we started to see a little bit more resistance. And that's where we started to face issues of investment and issues of really wondering whether or not school matters. But the truth is, is that whenever we've started working with kids, I think the vast majority of kids that we've worked with have been, have been really invested in education. Um, I think underlying that, I would just add one more piece, which is just that like underlying that, I think is always a little bit of jadedness a little bit of cynicism, a little bit of will school really matter for me and will school really make a difference for me? Um, but yeah. So I remember the first day I walked into a classroom, I actually had a desk thrown at me. Um, and the desk almost hit me. And then I had a child charge at me. And I remember thinking post that day, there's just no way that I can do this. And the number of times that thought came back to me was probably in the dozens for my first six months. And I came back to that thought every single time I, you know, came up to a tough situation, every single time I came face to face with the inequity my kids faced. And I'll tell you what I think kept me through it. And I think I'm going to share my example because I think there's a similar strain with our fellows and with all teachers. And I think it was reminding myself of two things. One is that what my kids were facing was exponentially worse than what I was going through in that classroom. And two is that the last thing that my kids needed was another adult that could walk out on them. And I think because of my recognition of that, I think it kept me going. I think over time, what fueled that was realizing that my kids had so much potential. And I think that's actually what keeps me here today is the recognition that underlying all of the struggle, underlying all of the inequity, underlying all of the challenges that come with that are the immense assets that our kids bring to the table, the immense potential our kids bring to the table. Um, and that's what I would say more than anything else is the recognition of that potential.